I felt I wanted to take a moment and put out an audio coverage as the certified auditor that I am about what's going on with Terra Luna, because I see that there's a little bit of misinformation being spread around and there's a lack of other information, both of which can concern me at least a little bit. And I figured, let me just go ahead and talk about what I see and share some information. This may be a benefit to you if you're curious about it. So if you're in as a holder of Terra Luna or a holder of UST, I certainly hope not, but I know some people are still holding kind of trying to see what's going to happen. And I'm referring of course to Luna classic, not Luna shiny. So there's some information that's coming out on a regular basis. I am followed closely. I follow at a distance, but I figured I'd summarize kind of what's happening. So there's information spreading around, around this business of terror rebels. And there's a little bit of hopium, I think being communicated around terror rebels. I say it's hopium because if you followed my various videos I was doing around Terra Luna, Luna Classic, you would have known and heard me say that I said, ultimately, it's a race to the top. It's not that it's impossible for it to get up to a penny or to a dollar. It's just highly improbable. You would have heard me say that Do Rug Pull, formerly known as Do Kwan, ultimately conspired on the Dow to do things the way he wanted, which is to abandon this older token. You would have heard me align it somewhat to Ethereum Classic and what happened back then because it was a similar type situation. You would have heard me call out that ultimately Luna Classic has a very organic level of support behind it. Terra Rebels then is, so you understand, I'm going to simplify this down without the hopium part. The Terra Rebels is essentially a group of community members who have varying skill sets who came together in an attempt to help save this token. And I said, it has a very strong level of community support behind it. They are the byproduct of this support. You need to understand though, that Terraform Labs TFL was largely responsible for being able to work the code. So anytime that there was any sort of DAO vote that was passed, TFL had to be involved in order to get the code reworked for whatever reason. TFL, largely, I would argue, coerced by Do Rugpull, has not been willing to help the terror rebels do what needs to be done. So, if you've been voting in the DAO, you likely would have seen that things haven't been moving, at least not that you can see. And that's because there wasn't anybody actually acting on the proposals, thus defeating the purpose of the DAO, because the whole point of the DAO is that anything the community votes on should be executed. However, Do Rugpull, conspire to basically coerce the one group that would have done to only focus on the new Luna, Luna Shiny. So Terra Rebels comes in and they say, well, we can do some stuff, but we don't have help from TFL. We've tried. They're not responding to us. We've tried every outlet we can think of. They are not responding to anything we try to do, even to try to work for them. So then when they found finally one person who was in TFL to say, hey, let's come together. Let's work this together. Let's make this work. These people, ultimately, there was it, it hasn't worked out because they're just one person. Some of the developers that were there have chimed in, but not as part of TFL. There still has to be the TFL inclusion. It's not there. And remember, there's a lot of code that TFL has knowledge around to make it easier to do the work. Without TFL, Essentially, Terror Rebels is kind of starting from scratch and kind of rebuilding knowledge to start from the ground up. This actually is much more similar to what happened to Ethereum Classic than even I had initially speculated because Ethereum Classic had the same challenges. And I believe firmly that these people, the Terror Rebels, when you hear the name and you see what's going on, I believe they had the best of intentions. I've actually reviewed a lot of their documentation. They have a Discord channel. They have a GitHub. They've, they've been transparent about the code changes they want to make. I reviewed the code changes. I don't have any concerns with what they're trying to do. I see the con concept of what they're trying to do. No concerns with any of this. And what they've also gone and done is they've called out concerns with what they're doing. And I want to summarize this because this is where I think the hopium is getting in the way. Understand that what Terror Rebels ultimately is just doing is making sure that whatever the community votes through the DAO gets attention and is actually executed. 
this doesn't necessarily mean that what they're doing is going to be quote good or going to make a difference. And you're like, er, understand that their whole vision is if the community wants X, we need to give them X, whether TFL is going to do it or somebody else does it. We need to give them X. We're not here to make a decision about what to do. We're following the voice of the community. So the community has put out a bunch of proposals and I'll talk about some of those, but Ultimately, the, com the community is trying to get the price back up is what they're trying to do. And there's a number of different things that go along with this. Now, with these changes, some of the reasons why there were these immediate breaks put on things and things were kind of left untouched or untapped was because of fears that there might be a, an attack on, you know, people, holders, et cetera, liquidity, apps. There were concerns that the chain might have some halting or some issues. There are all these problems that were anticipated or expected as part of what's going on. So once we see that, yes, there were legitimate reasons why they needed to stop things, now they're saying, well, let's take a look at what the community is asking and how can we introduce these things in a safe way? And we're working without TFL, so it is going to be more challenging. They're transparent about this. They're saying, we're going to do what the community says. At the end of the day, we can't say whether it's going to be good, bad, or otherwise. We're just following what the community has voted on, and we're assuming good thought has been put into it. And that's all they're doing. They're not making an independent decision, and I respect them for this. So as I looked at all the different code changes that they're proposing to introduce, they have to do a basically a pull request from GitHub, implement the changes, and then, of course, you need validators to do the changes. Some of the validators have already jumped ship to the shiny Luna. There are still a pretty good number of validators left on the old chain. However, they don't know if they're going to remain. They don't know if they're going to be willing to do this because it's work on their side as well. That's an unknown. And it means that the hopium has to kind of be managed a little bit because you have to have people to implement the code. You have to be able to implement it safely. And you have to have validators to actually execute. So there's multiple parts of this that some of which are gaps right now and have not been resolved. So going through the concerns primarily that they were talking about with the tax. So I'm going to focus on the tax and I'll go with the IBC. With the tax, they wanted to introduce this 1.2% tax to try to help burn off this excess supply. They said that the hyperinflation had been disabled. However, multiple people have done analysis and they see that the daily supply still seems to be increasing. From what they're calling out, it looks like the burn is also designed to try to get ahead of it which tells me that the hyperinflation is still in place. I can't confirm it, but it does look like the supply is truly not going down. And the only reason that would be is if the hyperinflation, the printing of tokens always was still active, despite Doe rug pull saying it was turned off. So the first concern is, quote, tax is bad for long-term growth. Their Terra Rebels is transparent to say, we don't know if it's going to be positive or negative. We don't know. We're going off what the community tells us, which is we want to do the tax. We can always change the tax with another proposal labor. later. We can also introduce a variable. We can do a bunch of different things, but at the end of the day, we're going to need to have the community guide us. We're implementing it because the community told us it needs to be implemented. We're not taking a side. And that needs to be clear. Under no circumstances is their desire to do the code an affirmation from them that it's going to make it any better. It's just a theory based on somebody's post on there in the DAO that we want to do this because we think it's going to help. It could very well be folks that you do the burn and it still doesn't deal with supply. It doesn't hurt, but it wouldn't help. Could be that there are other down points, which is covered in the next concern. Quote, the tax concern, the tax will break connections to certain DApps and exchanges. Terra Rebels acknowledges that this is the case even with their own testing. Apparently what's happened is that some of these DApps, some of these exchanges what they apparently do, and I don't know why they do this, but it seems like in order to know when they get a transaction, right? So you go in, you want to do a transaction, a swap or anything. You do a transaction. What they coded it to do is to do an initial one Luna query, get the gas fees back, and then take your transaction and do the work. I don't know if that's because there's missing methods to just iterate through the gas fees, because that's how you normally would do it, is just say there's actually built-in functions to query what the gas is going to be. I don't know why you would do it with the one, 
I'm not sure. But apparently even the Terra's, Terra's own tools are built to do this. And so the problem is that when you do that first one, that one's going to be jacked up because it's not built to handle a tax structure. <laughs> and so that's it's going to take a lot of rework pretty much across the board. Developers and everybody are going to have to rework their tools in order to properly support the tax and integrate it in and ideally they would enumerate what the gas fees are in a different way that doesn't have this problem in the future. Now, what's the level of effort of that? No way to know because there's no way to know how complex some of these applications are. On the upside, though, they believe that at the end of the day, their changes should not be super disruptive because in a past world, what they had was there was a, another tax related to UST that was already in place. And so the theory is that many of these developers should have already implemented similar code to handle the UST tax and should be able to retrofit it over into Luna Classic. I would support that, but it depends on whether the developers are willing to do it. And if they're not, what happens? It's possible those developers say, okay, screw this. I'm just going to go to Luna Shiny. Well, that's not really a service to the users, but that's kind of the decision point, right? Because remember in Ethereum, many of the developers jumped to the new Shiny and the new Shiny took off and went running. Ethereum Classic went to a point, but it got nowhere close to the shiny Ethereum. So again, it's this race to the top. We're going to see what plays out. So then they talked about the distribution of fees to the community pool, and they put it to say 50% transaction fees, community pool. The one, well, there's two, but really one concern is we need to have people to actually execute the burn proposal. So basically a monthly proposal for Burns, who's going to initiate this. And we are, they're trying to see if the creator of the initial proposal is willing to do it because it seems like that this has to be kind of manually managed. I don't know the reason for this is like a code limitation or something else in place. I don't know why it needs the proposal as a monthly base, unless it's just over time, there needs to be some like a re- like every month reassess whether we continue to do this. I'm not sure the reason why they expect it to be manual because the, the implementation is automated. So I'm not sure the concern why they need it to be uh, the proposal to be implemented every month. I'm not sure there, which goes to the second one in a way quote, what prevents the abuse of comp of community funds? Well, the community pool and how things are distributed from the community pool is all governance. So once again, Governance is guiding who has access to the funds and how things work. And that may be why they're looking for the monthly proposal to reassess it per month, just on a regular basis to manage it. This may have been something TFL was just doing on behalf. I'm not sure. So then the other proposal is the IBC. And I, I have a beef with the IBC because nobody ever made it clear outside the crypto bubble, what exactly is going on here. So understand how, Everything works in the way Luna was built. They have these what are called wormholes. And what they've done is they've allowed Luna and UST pools to essentially jump chains and be able to transfer between chains. And certain of these places have tokens that are trapped there and stuck there. And thus you can't transact them. You can't convert them. You can't transfer them. You can't burn them. You can't do anything because this IBC was disabled as part of this. They're, they were trying to keep people from complete loss on the external, these external sources. I don't know that it really did any good because ultimately the loss was still realized that the trick is that if the people didn't sell, there was still an opportunity to have recouped it. They might have assumed that further value loss might have continued if the IBC had stayed on due to arbitrage. This is a valid concern. And so they're now, the proposal was to turn it back on to allow multiple things to happen. Now, the challenge is that the IBC is part of, number one, it's part of the code. And so it's not hard to re-enable it, but there's a lot more to think about. And in, it, around UST, UST has other issues where developers run UST were calling concerns saying, I don't recommend that you turn this back on without some real hardcore thought here because of X, Y, Z. Conversations still have to happen to really understand what are those impacts and what are the downfalls and 
How can we safely turn it back on? Or is there another way to address the underlying risk and concern? At a big picture, though, there's kind of a common belief that the the synergy between UST, if it were stable, and Luna Classic is critical to the recovery of Luna Classic. Now, I don't know, In my, this is my opinion now, I don't know that the algorithmic is going to solve that problem, which means you'd have to somehow figure out to get UST to where it's not algorithmic. If you do it algorithmic, you continue the same risk for the same reasons, and you're right back to square one. So I don't know as of right now if they're going to try to get UST to be stable again, how they plan to do it, what they plan to do, what's going to be the approach. I don't have any of that information. I know that there's conversations to figure out how to get UST re-stabilized and re-pegged to the U.S. dollar. How they plan to do it is what's unknown. If they can get UST re-pegged and re-stabilized, it should increase the value of Luna Classic at least to some degree. Then you run into, and this is, again, Leicester giving you my assessment, you still have the risk that there were a crap ton of people who bought significant amounts of tokens when it rock bottomed and they never sold. So you essentially have a lot of whales sitting out there waiting to dump off the project if and when they were able to get it recovered. And I'm not sure what they would plan to do to mitigate that or even if they can. This is going to be somewhat of a concern, I think, for pretty much everybody who is who's at a significant loss, meaning that they were one of the previous holders, because I don't think that there's enough whales to where they could completely like crap it, but I do think that there's enough that got in as whales where they could keep it from getting where it should go, if that makes any sense. So there's not right now, uh, with the printing, the printing of the tokens is what really devalued it, and the printing at the time seemed like it made sense for when they were doing it. But if people are holding, let's say there's 6.5 trillion still, if people are holding 6 trillion, the burn's not going to do anything. That's kind of the open risk is, well, what's going to really go on here? You also have people that are sitting on UST who bought it for like pennies off the dollar. And then do they dump? And then what impact does that have? Which is why I said that if they're going to try to get UST repegged, I believe they would have to figure out how to get it to not be an algorithmic because of the fact that you now have a, essentially a bunch of whales, an unknown number of whales who could dump off the project. And I'm not sure how you could resolve that because they bought because it was allowed to be bought at that time. And people who are smart enough, frankly, to have bought, you know, literally hundreds of millions of these tokens. Remember, this guy, I believe, got as high as $130. So... Do I think it's going to get that high again? No. My point is, even if it got to a penny, if you got 100 million of these tokens, people are going to be dumping that, I guarantee you. And that's what has to be somehow managed and see what happens. In summary, Terra Rebels is doing the best they can to simply accord to what the DAO has voted and approved so that they don't sit there unserved. However, I would recommend managing your hopium about what will or will not happen. This isn't to say that there will not be any positive. It's to say that nobody really knows. They don't know because they're not making, they're not holding a stance either way. They're trying to take the ownership of making sure things get executed according to what the community wants and then seeing where things go. There's still a lot of work for the developers out there to change their D apps to support what's going on. There's still a lot of work for validators. There's marketing. There's a lot of different things that are still as yet to happen. So manage the hopium, let time pass, and we'll see what happens as part of this. If you are curious about what's going on with Terra Rebels, they do have a Discord channel. It's, it's called Terra Space Rebels. You can check out there. They have a really good communication flow and cadence. They also have meetings that they have, a steering meeting uh, through Discord, and then every now and then they'll do a Twitter Spaces. I do encourage you, if you're following Terra Luna Classic or UST, that you follow their Discord and just kind of keep an eye out for what they're doing and the chatter back and forth. 